in sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 Drive to Survive, Untold, and many more now on Netflix. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. Welcome to Scarlet's Fever, the home of Sussman Central and Westerer is Besterer. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Rap Podcast with me, Lee G. Joining me as per usual is Hugh. Good evening, Hugh. Good evening, Flat Cap number three Flat in Cap attendance three. tonight. I believe it's the debut of Flat Cap three this evening. De- debut of the blue Flat Cap match to my blue chinos because I'm stylish. Uh, and this is special because... This is the one that I was aforementioned on last week's pod that I got from Galway. Oh, okay. So it's got a story. It's got a history. I right. yeah. <laughs> do do so, you believe he's got two two chinos on? I reckon he's starkers. <laughs> Go on. He's just saying that. He's claiming to be. Oh, oh, no, there Go on so joining us this evening on the pod is uh, Welsh Twitter legend Ed Jenks uh, that you just did there. Ed, how are you, my friend? Shmai, bonsoir. How's it going, guys? All right. Very happy. Uh, very happy to come on. Thanks for having me. Thanks, thanks for having the fucking courage to platform me, frankly. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like thanks for being no, that crusading podcast for the, the courage to to platform me to hear the truths. Well, I'm surprised you haven't got one of your own, mate. I'd have thought this would have been right up your street no. where you can just sit there and just spout off shit for an hour, and and and, and people would yeah. sit there and listen to you. I I can't. Uh, I couldn't justify that to myself or frankly to my wife. So uh, <laughs> I think I, I'm, I already spend too much time procrastinating on, on Twitter uh, in the morning, especially when I should be working. So uh, no, I think uh, if, I, if I have to like produce my own podcast or something, uh, that would push things over the edge and it would just become ridiculous. So um, you, you, were, you were telling us just how nice the weather is out there just to really rub it into everyone back home listening because obviously it was scarlet so there's everyone walking around the streets of Finnechly where it's pretty dank dour pissing down um yeah still pissing down uh what's the weather like with you well the summer hasn't stopped to be honest it's just uh, been just just kept on going whereas usually now this time of year it would have you know the autumn would have set in a bit but um yeah, still in like shorts and t-shirts most of the time, and um, frankly, it's getting on my tits a little bit. Like I was saying, I'd quite happily get back to wearing trousers and uh, not having to use air conditioning at work. So, so yeah, that's that's. I'm, I appreciate it's probably got no sympathy, but yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to smug, but uh, it's a real, it's a real, uh, it's a real um, first world south of France problem, uh, shall we say? Yeah, uh, deal with that. But it is getting, it is getting worse. It's so ridiculously hot here all the time. Um, and it's just, uh, yeah. You must be the just, only uh, Welshman on the planet that goes, oh, I wish it was raining. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so well, You know you know where you are with the rain, don't you? Yeah, you, you can't be in my spot of rain, innit? Yeah. 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 
Well, it, I've got this theory about Slethley that Slethley's only got two types of weather. It's either raining or it's about to rain. Because yeah. and outside of that, there's nothing. That's that's the only thing. So it's got different. It's got different types of rain as well. You know, it's like uh, I was having this conversation with someone the other day. Actually, yeah, I was working with um, somebody from Brazil, and uh, she lived in Ireland, I think, for a few years, and we were talking about the rain. And she was saying about how it's funny that uh, in Ireland they have lots of different words for different types of rain. So it's kind of the same in Wales, you know. The weather report is not really the weather report. It's just like the rain report. It's like, what kind of rain are we going to have tomorrow? Is it going to be drizzly? Is it going to be showers? Is it going to be sleet? Is it going to be fucking horizontal? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I work with someone from Brazil as well. And we were talking about rain and I was like, oh, it's like a monsoon out there. And she was like, no. No. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you what it's like. That's not, that's not a, a monsoon. Yeah. In the country of the rainforest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, Ed, for, for people who don't know what you do on Twitter, uh, and there's not many of them, so tell us, give us a flavour of what you do on Twitter and, and how it kind of starts and, and things like that. Well, what do I do? I don't really have a... I don't really have a blueprint. Um, I just typically, okay. So typically, when I tweet, uh, I go. In, I leave the home at about six in the morning. Uh, take my kids into school, get the office about eight, um, have a cup of tea, uh, which time I feel too knackered to do much work for about an hour, and I just lie on the <laughs> thing and I just procrastinate on Twitter. And it's then when I do most of my tweeting, to be honest, even that sort of early hour or so. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. I just, um, well, obviously, I'm a, I'm a rugby fan. I've been mad about rugby since I was, you know, an infant. And um, always enjoy talking about it. And um, I think... Um, well, to get serious about it for a moment, uh, probably what started years ago is just being um, a Welsh person away from Wales. And, uh, you know, it was kind of my outlet into just speaking to other Welsh people about rugby and uh, sharing, you know, talk about rugby, but also it's more than that. It's about, you know, um, the sense of humour, enjoying that as well. And uh, so, so it's a bit long and rambling, but... Um, I don't really have I don't really have a an outlook or a blueprint. I I just like to, like to enjoy myself. Um, you know, have a bit of a have a have a bit of fun now and again. Um, you know, some people sometimes people get the joke, sometimes they don't. Um, mostly they don't. Um, especially the South African ones. Uh, the Irish <laughs> ones are kind of hit and miss 50-50. But um, yeah, I suppose uh, yeah, so there's that, and I also just, uh, I just like, uh, you know, revealing the truth and exposing hypocrisy and all that kind of serious shit as well. Like, uh, so, who's your favourite like international fans? Who's the favourite ones to wind up? Because I, I, I quite like Australians because you can wind them up in the middle of the day and night, and then they all wake up in the morning and then they argue amongst themselves about something you said the night before. And then you wake up in the morning and you've got a whole load of new arguments to go back at sort of thing. So I, I quite like Aussies, but who, who do you prefer kind of winding up or who takes the bait the most? Well, I find the Antipodeans aren't that prolific on Twitter. Um, I don't know if it's just not that much used. I mean, obviously, we have the time zone thing. So, you know, you can't really sort of like get into a war of words with them uh, live, as it were. You, you do have to sort of wait until they wake up. Mm. Which takes a little bit of the edge off, but yeah, for example, Kiwis. I'm not really don't really have much chat with Kiwis there. Um, until a few years ago, I didn't really have any exposure to South Africans either. But that's been an eye opener because, um, you know, nowadays uh, I I like to you know when there's something on like the World Cup or the Six Nations or something big, I like to make some predictions. You know, as conversation starters, shall we say? And now basically, ninety five percent replies are just like furious. South Africans, you know, <laughs> oh, you're talking cuck, bro. Like, uh, just, just, like, just going nuts at me um, because I, because I, um, I uh, tipped South Africa to lose. So now I'm just, just too tempting 
to 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 not tip them to lose, if you know what I mean, because uh, just you know all you have to do to infuriate them is to just say that you don't think they're going to win. And if 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 it's among like so the quarter final predictions, so you say quarter final, just I think this team will this match will go that way, that match will go that way, and then South African when I said I reckon France will give them a proper uh, proper good thump in, which <clears throat> I hope they do, but like uh, uh, and. And then 90% of my plays is not anyone talking about any of the other matches, just angry South Africans, furious South Africans, some of them. Genuinely furious, you know. It's like I say, I yeah, think I, I better not, I better not, I better not continue this with them because like they're gonna they're gonna lose their temper in the real world and like give their dog a kick in or something. Like I just I don't want that on my conscience. So just, just, I, just I try and keep it, I try and keep it okay? light. Just replies, <laughs> Are you all right, mate? Just <laughs> I've, I've, I've found that the Irish South African back and forth this World Cup has been exhausting. I'm so oh, bored of it. Hell. Oh, it's fucking tedious, isn't it? The, the Irish South African uh, rugby Twitter loving does my head in. It's, it's the most boring, tedious, and the chat is so, is so shit as well. Like, come on, lads, give me a break. The US thing is, though, the I, I, do, I do a twi- Twitter space with some South African fans, and when you're talking selection with them, they're actually like dead. Like head screwed on, and they go right. Okay, well the the game plan is this, and the options are this, and the combinations are this. Like you compare that to like a whale selection debate, where you get people going like, "Well, I don't like the way we're playing. We need to get rid of all these players. Yeah. He's rubbish. He's crap. <laughs> we need to get him in. This guy who's playing for I don't know, Carmarthen down in the in the Premiership. He <laughs> wants to be playing for Wales. Whereas South Africans are more screwed on. But then you get some of the comments, and you're like, "All right, okay, it's just a game, mate." <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, they, they they take it they take it very seriously. I don't know if it's like a difference um, in sense of humour, and um, and uh, I, maybe they just don't get the nuances. Not okay, that sounds like I'm talking down. I, I don't I don't uh, I think they just maybe have a different uh, style of discourse, different sense of humour, yeah. and uh, it just doesn't come across like sometimes when you're being a bit wry or taking the piss for want of a well, better word. Um, on on the rap podcast on Monday, uh, all the rest of the boys predicted England to beat Fiji, and I just I just couldn't bring myself to to do that. I couldn't. There's no way in the world I could predict an England win, let alone you know even if it was a point or whatever. So I I quite comfortably predicted a, a Fiji win by a good yep. comfortable twenty points, you know. <laughs> and the shit I had off that was I like I. I'm not, uh, you know, one, I'm not putting any money on it. So I'm not going to, you know, it's not like there's money at stake here. And two, it's a prediction. <sighs> you know, yeah. if, if you don't like it, people, then... People lose their minds about predictions, though. <laughs> they lose their minds. Yeah. Well, talking about predictions and rugby <laughs> and, and things like that, let's let's talk about the Scarlets, because you're a, you're a big Scarlets fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How's that going for you at the minute? Because it's, it's pretty rough for the rest of us. <laughs> Probably about as well as it's going for anyone, to be honest. I mean, I'm trying to be philosophical about it. Um, I think there's still a lot of good stuff going on down at the Scarlet. Um, I think that given the circumstances, it's a comparatively well-run club. And that's I, I, what I get from speaking to people involved, quite high levels at other clubs. You know, I think we do well to get lots of sponsors and, um, you know, lots of local sponsors and engage in the community. I mean, of course, uh, I'm sure people will have stories saying there's things we don't do well and, and I wouldn't dispute that for a moment. But, um, you know, we still manage to bring through a fair, uh, fairly decent amount of talent, albeit perhaps uh, not the level we were five, ten years ago. But then that's something which can, uh, I'm sure, be righted with the right investment and work and everything. I mean, I still have this undying belief that we're the greatest club in the world uh, and uh, that we will become the first uh, European club to do La Decima of 10 European Cups. I still like uh, very much tied to that. So it keeps When's me, that going to Keeps me going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's not about when it started, but it's about when it finishes. You know, don't uh, <laughs> don't be don't get impatient. But um, I don't know. I I feel like obviously it's frustrating watching this week in week out, and and it's hard to have any real um, high expectation about the coming season. But I think there are green shoots, and I think that I think we are, I think we can build off of what's going on. 
And I think a lot of the problems we have in Welsh rugby with funding and, you know, being in the URC and all this kind of stuff is it's kind of out of our control. So we've got to roll with it. But, um, no, I think that there are green shoots. I think um, I, I, I think what Dwayne is doing is good. Um, I like some of the players we signed for the coming season. Plumtree, Lloyd. I mean, these boys, uh, you know, we signed them on potential. And they're not going to bring us like that power game that perhaps helps. You know, we need to compete at the top level, but they certainly extremely skillful athletic players, which is fits in well with our DNA and just keep on keeping on, isn't it? Really, I mean, uh, I I don't know. I mean, probably come on to it about what your expectations are for the season. I mean, do, do you share? Do you share? Am I being optimistic? Am I being? Am I being deluded or? or what were, what are your guys' perspectives? I'd say that I'd say that ten European trophies is optimistic, definitely. Uh, yeah, but that's <laughs> that's over the next that's over the next twelve or thirteen seasons, so we've got time yeah. to get there. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, sometimes I think it helps to be deluded to be a Scarlet supporter. Uh, there was a point last season. I, where... I dispute that we're deluded. I don't think. I think we're. I think we're. I think we're the, we're the most balanced fan base, and uh, yeah, accurate, balanced, and best looking as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, I spent I some time talking to Munster fans, and obviously Munster fans are on top of the world at the moment. But and God love them, I don't want to slag them off or anything. But I don't, I don't wish I was a Munster fan. I'm I'll slag them off. This fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it is a lot surprises. No, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to get you, I don't want to start you lads off with any beefs and any other podcast like by talking shit about Munster. But I can if you want. But like yeah, Munster. <laughs> See, but. but it's good that we we're in a position where up is the only way, really. For this, if if we end up in a worse league position this season than we were last season, I mean, fucking hell, something seriously, seriously wrong if we end up like that. And I just, like I said, we we've we've signed a lot of good quality players. Um, I keep calling him Titicum, but it's not; it's Titcum. Um, the outside out. Uh, um, he's one of the he's one of the size boys who came from the university league, isn't he? Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, and, I don't know anything about I don't know anything about those. As I, I can only assume that if they've got pro contracts at this level, they must be pretty tidy. So mm. that's great. I mean, but it's like punts, you know. It's it's kind of like mm. um, what else can we expect? You know, we we signed, we got, we picked up some gems in the past. I mean, you know, I remember signing guys like back in the day, like the Easterby brothers. You know, Dai Hodges, Finau, like uh, a lot of this that we built, one of our strongest teams of the pro era. I would not, our strongest team of the pro era, uh, you know, uh, on. Um, so we've done it before, and I think it's just we don't really have a choice. But um, Ty Burns, some of them, some of them come that. off, some of them don't, you know. Hmm. Tad Burn is is the one. Oh, Burn, did... Burn, yeah, of yeah. course. The Tag Burn. We made yeah. Tag Burn. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we made the East to be boys. Like, there would be nothing, <laughs> nothing if it wasn't for us. <laughs> but I, Islands, list- Islands Rugby World Cup campaign would be nowhere yeah. if it wasn't for us developing Tyburn. Yeah. When he was lifting that URC trophy for He'd months, be an irrelevant. Just thought, just thought he did it with us. Yes. This should be paying us fucking royalties for Tyburn, I'm telling you now. <laughs> well, and um, East to be. I mean, East to be's right hand man in Ireland now. And yeah, East to be. Fuck me. For, yeah. Um, the, the 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 brainchild of their of their of their clinical forward dominance over the last two or three years, the the linchpin of their pack, it's all made in slightly like. Yeah, it was all. Don't get that. Don't get. I don't see that getting uh, enough credit to be honest. So I'm here well, to change that. I can I can see a point in the future where Easterby will come home. I can I can see a point after the World Cup, where his contract ends after the World Cup. He still lives in Wales, and yeah. he's does he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah he's he's isn't he married to Sarah, Sarah Elgin of uh, That's it. That's it. Oh, yeah. the, the, yeah, the TV yeah. That's presenter, right. isn't yeah. he? I think yeah. I think I got that right. Or yeah. another TV yeah, yeah, presenter. Yeah, yeah, I think that's correct yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. And um, so yeah, he's constantly back and forth, and then you know that takes it out of you after a while, and your kids are growing up and all that kind of stuff. So coming back home to Wales kind of makes sense. Um, and I can see someone finding a vacancy for him, and I hope it's us. I genuinely can. It would be amazing, yeah. I mean, I mean, coming home to us, or maybe getting involved in the national setup. I mean, 
Um, to use a sort of wanky buzz term that's going around a lot, but that would be great rugby IP to get mm. back from there, um, to get, get, get back guys like him and McBride eventually. Because, um, you know, for all they do my head in, they're doing a lot of things right in Ireland in terms of coaching and development of players. So it'd be great to... Um, hmm. To have a little bit of that coming back, yeah, to tap it? tap into that, and uh, you know, get some insight. That'll be that'll be great. Hmm. So let's let's do Hello. let's do URC stuff then. So I mean, pre season has been pretty shit, and everything's kind of. I mean, we 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 brought some good players in. We've not really seen much of them, in all honesty. Um, what are we expecting from the URC season? What, what, what's your thoughts on how we? We're starting off in South Africa, two games in South Africa. What's your thoughts on that? What do you reckon, Hugh? I think it's going to be a tough start. I think, you know, you used to be able to look at the, the league and pick out some easy games, whether it be like the Italian sides or some or Connacht or, or someone like that. They're not easy games anymore. I mean, Zebra obviously were pretty, pretty poor last season. The Italian rugby sadly doesn't look like it's in a good place at the moment. But... Um, other than Zebra, I don't think there's an easy game. And I think if you're going away from home, especially, you're struggling to pick out a win. Um, so, you know, what would the, even if the box is still away at the World Cup, I still don't necessarily think any any URC team, let alone the Scarlets, is going to get many results down in South Africa anytime soon. Uh, it's quite funny watching all of the... Uh, the English find that out in the Champions Cup when they go, oh, URC's this and that, and then they go down and play them themselves and go, oh, this is a bit hard. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a tough start. I just don't want to be in the position we were in last time where we're going to Christmas, we haven't, we haven't won a game. And we're mm. just like, the season's over before it's even begun. That's just the, the, what I'm hoping to avoid. Mm. I, I think that I think that we, we ended, the second, the back end of last season was promising. Uh, we had a great sort of the, the sort of third quarter of the season, the run-in. We, we we were brilliant. We went on an unbeaten run, got some great results. Um, it was the reign kind of, of terror, as I re- recall. The reign of terror, yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I so saw some guy put some, that PR spin on, I can't remember who, but yeah. Um, yeah, so it was reign of terror over, over the back end of last season, and then we sort of fell off a little bit at the end. Uh, even though you know, we, in the end, we had nothing to play for because we were so cack the first half of the season. But uh, uh, I think if we continue on that, we, we found our style of play and we found uh, our balance, and uh, we started to look good. And um, hopefully, with boys like Costello coming back from the World Cup, um, full of confidence, hopefully, we can get another season or two out of uh, Caldo. I think there's every reason to be confident that we can, you know kick on from last season at least we haven't lost a significant amount of players apart from Callum Foney obviously although you know with his age profile he's probably coming probably only going to get another year out of him max anyway um, so I, I think we can develop and kick on I mean it would probably be I mean it, the best case scenario I think if you could try and qualify for the playoffs you know I think we're, we're I think we are we're around mid-table if you just look at it objectively in terms of the quality in our squad and what we can do. So why not, you know, get into that uh, playoffs and take it from there, you know? Mm. Um, mm. I just think that we're, we're going to struggle like we have in recent years for power um, and depth, key times during the Six Nations. Could probably be a lot of kids playing, uh, but we're not in the position where, like Cardiff are in, where they're basically going to be <laughs> playing semi-pro, semi-pros and under eight, under 20s at the time. Um mm. So and they're then the European Cup as well, and it's like an absolutely uh, mild weekend week out. But um, well, yeah, mid table the... mid-table playoff that would be great. Maybe win the win the Challenge Cup. Mm, that'd be nice. <laughs> well, yeah, one of the boys on the on the Cardiff uh, podcast has put a fiver on Cardiff winning the European Cup because the odds are like five hundred to one. So he's gone. Well, I'll have a fiver on that, and we'll. <laughs> We'll see how that comes. I mean, I I don't think the Scarlet season in in, is... in what year? 
In what year? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody said oh, what year. They just said that they. Can did. we? Can we? Can we just? Can we just pause and, and do a little like um, detour about Cardiff for a second? I'm not going to reveal too much, but I think there's some pretty interesting stuff there happening behind the scenes that could transform transform them. So I'm not going to. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to. I don't want to like. <laughs> I tell you. I'll tell you off fair if you want. But uh, yeah, I've heard some pretty uh, interesting stuff about that. So Cardiff could be going places. In the next few years, I think. If, you say if, going if, places, if what, what do you mean? Like, in you a mean? good sense. In a, in a good sense. Not, not, not as in going. Not else. as in going. <laughs> not as in going somewhere else. Or go, going bankrupt. Although that could have been the case. Um, but I think. Uh, mm. I think uh, Cardiff could be into something. Uh, some pretty interesting times. But then we're all tied into this six-year agreement, and no matter how much money we now get into the club, the playing budget is set by the WIU. So, yeah. Yes and know. no. I mean, come on, these WIU agreements, they're not worth the people they're written on half the time. Yeah, and I was, like, was going to say this. <laughs> uh, they, they make it up as they go along. I, I think I think if real money were to come into the game, um, yeah. then the WIU are not going to say, oh, yeah, but you can't spend more than 3.2 million uh, on... Uh, you're not gonna, I think they're going to be like, oh, yeah, fuck that, go for it, boys. Because hmm. as well, they, they want the clubs in private hands because they can't, they have neither the desire nor the interest nor the means to, to run them themselves, like have union run teams like you do in Ireland or, or, or elsewhere. Um, they need them to be run privately. So I think if significant private investment were to come in, then uh, they, they, they wouldn't uh, put a serious roadblock in the way of that. Why would they? Hmm. Well, I you agree. know. Scarlet's have just announced that uh, 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 who's it again? Yeah, Oil for Wales are sponsoring again. So you know, it's, um, it's not, <laughs> I, I don't think we're quite the at the Dubai investment yet, but you know, the boys are getting there. We yeah, Mike Mike Phillips <laughs> is working on that for us. He's out there in Dubai. He's working hard. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking up. Yeah, I thought he was very brave of S4C to give Mike Phillips a microphone and nobody with him and just ask him to go and, and talk about stuff with people in the crowd. And, you know, so Mike just give Did us... Did they do that? Message. Yeah. Jesus. With, with Mike Phillips. And you're like, so the, the editor's got to be on the on the button there. Go, <laughs> go to advert, go to advert. But, yeah, the, 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 the S4C uh, World Cup coverage is actually, I find, being a lot of fun. I, I, don't, I don't watch a lot of it. I just mainly watch the games live on sort of French TV. But when I went to watch uh, playback, or I, I, for example, I, I missed the Georgia game live. I was watching Sean at a game last weekend away, so I went to see that exactly the same time. So I missed it live, watched it back on S4C, and the coverage is a lot of fun, hmm. you know. Uh, Robin McBride and Mike Phillips are uh, hilarious together. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more like uh, sort of in jokes and intimacy, and in fact, it's all like. Hmm. <laughs> Welsh and just like a bunch of people who've known each other for a long time. It's, it's quite funny. Um, Even Jason Mohammed comes across really well. And I don't mean, I mean, when he's on telly as a news reader or whatever, he's he's very straight down the line, like, you know, and he's actually, because he can relax a bit, I guess, he, he comes across really well, I find. No, they have some good, I um, yeah, I mean, you know, like uh, they roll him out for the World Cup. I don't know how much of the rugby stuff he'll be doing, but. Uh, I really like Lauren Jenkins. I think she's um, I think she's a fantastic fast. rugby journalist and fantastic broadcaster. Mm. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite good. I mean, I, I watch that. I hear a lot of people whinging and moaning about um, uh, the HTV coverage. Watched a bit of that and it's fucking unwatchable. Like uh, so, <laughs> like, what were you uh, talking about? I, I, to- uh, I totally uh, segued into some something else. Could be different now. Did you see there was a uh, a photo on Twitter of my favourite commentator uh, uh, Shanklin commentating on the Fiji game from a studio? Yeah, so All right. the actual live commentary he was watching the game on telly like the rest of us, and then that was being broadcast as if they were in the bloody stadium. I mean, how? Fucking cheap is that? It's, yeah, and it was it was like listening to paint dry. It was awful. 
But there we go. That's I'm not going to get because he's very sensitive, is Tom, and he doesn't like it when people say things, especially when you say it on his Twitter timeline. As I, yeah, I'm going <laughs> okay, to tag in. I'm going to tag in. Uh, I'm going to tag in. Uh, tag him into a, a tweet now with the, with this video clip of you where uh, destroying him. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is the bit I love about doing interviews with, with people in different places, is that you get a whole rugby training session going on in the back and someone having a beer. I, I can't fault that. Yeah. Do, do, you want to, do you want me to show you around a little bit? So I'll show you around, yeah, right? Go on. Yeah. So okay, this well, is for audio this is studying, this, this is, is, might be a bit weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I try and uh, I try and narrate it as when as when with an audio book to really bring it to, to, to life in a vivid sense. So uh, it's about seven about seven year local time. Uh, here we have the training pitch. We have like six training pitches. They're all sort of five G. And uh, here we have the under 18s doing a training session. So my son plays for them. He's uh, you see him. He's the one with the ridiculous stuff on his head. Um, and uh, they have been. They'll be training until about eight o'clock. Behind me, we have the main stadium, which you can't see here because it's got all these marquees there. This is like all the VIP area. It's like about five five thousand seat stadium. And uh, the club plays in the French third division, so national. But uh, I'm a fully professional squad, probably a budget comparative to something like the Dragons or something like that. Uh, we have a few players at the World Cup as well, so that's quite exciting. Uh, Scotland used this installation for, uh, they've used it as their base for the entire World Cup. And um, they recently left because I believe they got knocked out. Is that true? <laughs> well, didn't they get um, robbed? Didn't, didn't, Scotland, didn't Scotland get brutally robbed and, and yeah, knocked out despite being a world know. record? Yeah. Oh, you got your mug through. Amazing. I'm yeah, still yeah. waiting for mine. <laughs> but that's, that's, <laughs> from, that's from, Leslie, from, from Leslie, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I'm waiting for mine. So uh, they left behind, and fair play to them, uh, fair play to Scott, take the piss and all that, but they left behind about 50 grand with the uh, state of the art uh, kit, wow. training kit, like a, like a connected scrum machine, I believe. I, I, I want to see that, you know, it's like... Is that one that it kind of measures the, the pressure going up against and yeah. it can push back and stuff? Yeah. So, the, yeah. The, Scotland, Scotland, the SIU got a long relationship with Stadley Swire. So they used to be shareholders in the club until, oh. like, around before COVID because they had this thing whereby... Because um, uh, they've only got two pro teams. Yeah. Um, they wanted a decent level of rugby beneath the pro teams to develop players. It's a big problem in Wales as well, right? We just twatting around with the premiership to try and do something with it. They do this super six thing or something in Scotland, which I don't think really works seven either. Now. There's, there's seven yeah, now. right. So they, they, <laughs> they, their strategy a few years ago was like, we're just going to invest in a, in a French second, third tier club and send our best days over there. It's a much higher level of rugby. It's basically mm. pro rugby. It's like second tier level pro rugby. So, um, they did that, and a number of current Scottish internationals actually played out here. What's the boy who fell down the steps when he was pissed and went ended up at the World Cup? Oh, the hooker. Yeah, just before. Cherry, yeah. Dave Cherry. Yes. Dave Cherry yeah. started off his pro career in Nice, which is quite ironic, seeing as how it seemed to have ended here as well. <laughs> um, among others, so we had a few... Uh, and so they basically is a long relationship with the SIU. They, they're not shareholders in the club anymore because the club went through the leagues, and I think they needed more serious investment and it just the, the level is up now you can't just bring in promising under 18 under 20 boys and chuck them in it's just far too high level of rugby so mm. so who was the first person from the Scott SIU who floated that idea it's like what are we going to do about developing young players you know why don't you buy me a plane ticket to Nice I'm like, what? <laughs> like, no, yeah. trust me trust me this, this yeah, stick and... with this yeah yeah this, I think this... it did I think it did work it brought in it it brought in a few players who ended up getting like becoming first team regulars in Edinburgh and Glasgow. Um, and I think it was not a bad strategy, but it obviously required a lot of investment because to run a club even at this level is big money. You know, Nisa Nisa are currently close to the top of National, they're trying to get into Pro Deux. Mm. And you know, Pro Deux budgets are bigger than pretty much anything in the URC outside of Ireland. So, mm. you know, it's uh, it's 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 not it's not a those clubs, clubs who are aspiring to that are not really development tools in, in that sense. 
Mm. You know, there's a lot of pressure week in, week out to win your games and to have strong squads. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, so, so, so I've run his course. <laughs> I've run his course and then COVID came along and then they just... Yeah, did off. yeah. When when I was visiting the south of France, I did get a sense of like, oh no, rugby is actually big here. Like, rug- people properly care about rugby, and that's not like it is in England. Even in somewhere like the Midlands, which is normally a rugby like place in in England, it's like, oh no, in the south of France, no, rugby is like the sport. Oh yeah, it's, it's huge. Like to give you an idea, um, well, anecdotally, I mean, we we play, we have away, we have away fans, we have like hundreds. Sometimes over a thousand away fans for a match here when clubs like historical clubs like Narbonne, Bezier, these are big clubs with big followings, which are really the heartbeat of their towns. A bit like Clashley and Scarlet. You know, it's very similar to South Wales or what it once was in South Wales, especially with towns like Ponty, Clashley, Neath. You know, these mm. clubs revolve around the, the rugby club. Mm. Um, last year, when Sean was in the under 16s, they got to the semi final. Of the of the championship cup, uh, and it's the first time a club from Nice, because the academy is quite young, has got to that. So it was about a couple of thousand people in the stadium. They played against uh, Bourgoin, who brought down about three or four hundred fans for an under 16s match, right? So um, <laughs> with with drums and flares and all kinds of mad shit, wow. it's brilliant. And this is for like an under 16s match. So yeah. this is the kind of passion you have. Nice is a big city mm. club, so Nice is the fifth biggest city in France. It's primarily a football city, although, although it does have a rugby history. But the, the strength of rugby around here goes to Toulon, which is just down the road, you know. Toulon is the rugby place. But Nice is a big city, it's quite a wealthy city, so there's big plans to develop the club and to, to bring it through. But yeah, to, to, to there's in the south of France, there's this incredible passion and clubs which are incredibly well supported, like in National which is again the third year you have clubs which regularly draw in thousands you know every week clubs you know better attendances than anything some of the worst attendances in the URC I mean they put like the Italian teams and you know uh, even some of the Welsh teams at times to shame with their attendances Um, but see that's that's what we proper big yeah yeah that's what we we need more of is like we're talking about the drums and the flares and the it's it's an event. If you're 16 and you're running out and people are on the drums and all this kind of stuff, and <clears throat> yeah, you're yeah. gonna love that game. Do you know? And and it's, it's, it's a it. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 amazing. And uh, but you can't manufacture that. That's the mm. thing. It's either part of the culture. Like in other, I think you get that different degrees in different um, rugby countries. So I know that in, for example. Well, Ireland and South Africa, schools rugby is a big thing, right? So you see, it's just part of their rugby history and DNA, whereas it's, it doesn't, it's not, it's never been a thing in Wales. So you go to schools matches where you have like thousands of people watching and people, are, you know, super passionate about it and all that. And, you know, that's that's their thing. In, in, in France, it's always been club rugby. So there's an extremely passionate and uh, loyal uh, following for club rugby in the south of France. Um, and they fostered that over over a, for over a century. I mean, the Bouclier de Brennus, the French Championship, it's been going on since the 19th century. You know, so you can't you can't just build that thing overnight. And that's, uh, I mean, I, I mean, this this could be a whole other podcast. I'm not going to bore you too tough about it. But this is my whole thing about regions and the URC and all this. It's just like totally manufactured constructs to sort of build something out of nothing with no real pedigree and mm. you know it's always destined to be a bit tepid to be honest I think but um that's the strength of French rugby though that is the strength of French rugby is is and as you see at this World Cup I mean it's basically props up the professional game I mean I saw a stat the other day about how many uh players at the World Cup are employed in France you know um yeah. It's like the majority, like especially when you talk about tier two, the majority of tier two players, and I'm thinking like 18, 90%, something ridiculous, um, are employed in French, in French rugby. I mean, there's 16 clubs put in the 14. There's like, there's about 45, 50 fully pro rugby clubs in France with fully yeah. pro squads and academy systems and all the rest of it. And it's just, it's just mind blowing. There's no, nothing anywhere near that anywhere else in the world. No. 
Yeah. Well, I'm going to start a campaign now for, for this season to get somebody inside Parker Scarlet's. One one person's got to bring a trumpet for a game, and then someone's got to bring a big a big drum, and then we're just going to sing and have songs all the way through, and that's going to be the start of the future way of that we do the Scarlet's. That's um, that's my mission now for this season is to make Scarlet's more. I mean, we need the sun. I'll give you that. So, but <laughs> to make it more French, so we'll have some some trumpets and some drums. Maybe you wear some your beret. Dance. Wear your beret to a match. That'll be a start. We, we already we already have the, we already have the best fans. Well, that's the great thing about the Scarlets. I mean, we are the best fans. Like, there's nothing even. Uh, close. You see, I was listening to the Dragons Jesus. podcast the other day, and apparently they have the best fans. <laughs> Bollocks! <laughs> <laughs> oh no, there's nothing. There's nothing. Like you put the Scarlets away. Like, for example, I go a lot of Scarlet's away trips in France. It's just amazing, the atmosphere, the singing, the passion. Mm. It's brilliant. I I went to um, um, Scarlet's versus London Irish when London Irish were in Reading, God rest their souls, um, a couple of years ago. And there was like three times as many Scarlet's fans as there was London Irish fans at that game. Mm. Yeah, but that's right. We are a proper club. We are a proper club with a proper fan base and a proper history and all the rest of it. Mm. And that's how you, you know, that's 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 how you build it. You can't construct that. And we still hate the Ospreys, r- regardless of which club it is, whether it's Neath or whether exactly. it's who, who aren't you know. who aren't a proper club, you know. <laughs> We're just a, a total construct. God, I can just see so many clips coming out of this. We just go, oh, here's, do, here's do I <laughs> do I get in? Is there an Ospreys podcast? Yeah, like, yeah. Like they don't have yes, fucking Ospreys, yeah. do they? Yeah. I'm surprised about that. Okay. Well, he does them all. I do them all. I start. I started them all, mate. I I need to wind you somebody sl- up. You <laughs> slug. He's, he's he's on all of them. He's like. Yeah, but this is where my heart is. Really? Is, yeah, wow. yeah. <laughs> so, let's let's talk Wales and the World Cup then. Let's. Um, wh- what have you uh, made of the World Cup? Obviously, you're you're out there. You're um yeah. in in the area. What have you What have you made of it from where you are? I think it's been great. I mean. Um, I mean, it's created so much interest. Um, just so I coach the under 12s here in East, and uh, we've had to, we've got like about 70 kids, and uh, we had to turn away loads more. We just couldn't, didn't have the capacity. Yeah. Um, and that's the World Cup. I mean, it's a, it's a big club anyway, in terms of having lots of, you know, average 50, 60 players per age group. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's just been mad. And, um, and uh, the interest is generated, the buzz, it's been great. I was I was here, I went to all three games in Nice. I went to I went to Wales, Portugal, Japan, England, and Italy, Uruguay, which is a really great game. And um yeah, it's been magnificent. So um it's been a pleasure to 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 be involved with it and to to see it. And I'm really, really looking forward to going to Marseille. So I'm going to match on Saturday. I got uh, some friends coming over. We're all going to the match. Uh, go for a couple of days in Marseille. That would be amazing. And I'm so glad we've drawn Argentina as well. If, if for no other reason, then it'll be a great atmosphere and they will have a we'll have a great laugh. And you know, hmm. um, yeah, I, so, there's quite a few Argentinian boys at the club, like so. We've been having a having a bit of chat about that. Uh, yeah. So Hugh. What what are you making of team selections? Obviously, Falatau is the key one, um, mm-hmm. and then you know, do you risk bigger to start with? Just coming back, or I don't think oh, Anscombe's yeah. going to be back. But what's what's your call on um, on selection and for for Saturday? No, right, bigger all bigger all play. As I've got no doubt in my mind that Dan Bigger is going to play. Um, this is of he's retiring after the World Cup, so he he doesn't want that uh, Australia game going off in the 10th minute, whatever it was, to be his last cap. So he'll he'll play in this game. I've got absolutely no no doubt. It, this is this is how he's made. This is how he's built. I think Faletau, um, Fal- Faletau is obviously a miss and we're a worse team without him, but I don't think it's an end of the world injury. I don't think it's like if Sexton went down for Ireland or um, no. a, a player like that. I think... We're, I think we're better with him in the team, but I don't think it's game over without him. We In 2019, we didn't have him either, and we got to the um, semi-final without him for that as well. Uh, so I think Wainwright just moves across to number eight. 
Um, and then the question about is who goes to number six, and that that's the debate, isn't it? Is do you put a six at six, or do you put Jack Morgan at six and have Tommy Raffel come in at seven? Personally, I'd go Morgan and Raffel. I think that's probably the future for us anyway. Um, I just don't think I think Lydiat is is coming to the end, and I don't think Shunza is ready. Um, so I would go Jack Morgan over at six and Raphael in at seven. And then other than that, it would be it's going to be identical to the team that beat Australia. Mm. So there's been a lot of chat today about the structure, basically the back row and who goes where and all of that kind of stuff. So what's what's your thoughts on the on the back row? Because this has literally filled my timeline for today. It's just been constant. Um, what do you make of the back row selection? I think uh, I agree with everything that he was just said. I think uh, obviously Balatow was our best option at eight. Um, I think he still he struggled for the last couple of years to deliver on a consistently high level that we've become used to. Um, I trust Wayne Wright to do a great job at eight, so I think that that selection is natural. Wayne Wright to eight, I uh, really rate Wayne Wright always have done. So uh, you know, I'm glad to see him playing back at his best. Um, so I'm happy with that, albeit, you know, we can't have anything happen to him now because that that we are really um, struggling after that. Um, the rest of the back row selection is interesting. I think uh, I'd agree with you. I think uh, uh, Raffle at open side and uh, moving, over, moving Jack over is probably the right way to go, albeit I would, uh, if we had somebody... If we had like a prime Lydiate or if, you know, Chunza was ready, I'd prefer like a proper big six who's going to who's gonna get you that quick ball. Because I think that's where we are going to struggle against big... I think I think we might, especially now with um, uh, Matera out, I think, uh, I think we'll be all right, even if we have a smaller back row. But I do worry if we get like uh, an Island or a New Zealand in the semi-final, we need, we'd, we'd need that like big powerful athleticism especially uh, to combat them uh, around the breakdown and try and you know combat them on the on the gain line because we don't have those big athletic back rowers otherwise and I don't think that well I would disagree with you I think that going forward I think it's one one of uh, uh, Raffle or Morgan uh, not both and then we do need a proper six because I think our back row is lacks the size and athleticism otherwise to compete at a really high level and to do really you know whether it's a big whether it's a big um you know like smash merchant like Lydia who's gonna get you that uh, put in those high tack counts and get you that quick ball and slow down the opposition on the gain line or if it's more athletic six like somebody like uh, Plumtree for example or or Chunza if either of them come through I don't think Essentially, having two open sides is going to, you know, I think it lacks a bit of balance, especially in terms of line out. I mean, uh, I know here at an elite level, uh, at the club, for example, they were talking the other day that out of the back five, you need four line out options to be a serious team. Mm. And I don't think that, you know, already with Raffle and Raffle and uh, and Morgan, you've got that. You've only you've got three line options by default there. So I think you need somebody. You need a back. You need a six, which is a bit more rounded. And I think then you just let uh, Morgan and Raffles tear each other to shreds to be the best. A bit like Warburton and Tipperick did for a decade, and we got so much out of those two players. But I think they 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 got a lot out of each other as well. You know, I mean, I don't think either of them would have been as good as they were if they didn't have the other one and that mm. pushing them and that competition. So I think that's amazing that to have two such great talents going forward, taking us through the next decade, more or less. So I think that's magnificent, but we do need to find a proper six. But for for this World Cup, I think he was right. It's got to be a ref and Morgan because there's nothing else there, really. Hmm. I, I think the thing with our, well, the back row as a whole in Wales at the minute, we're totally blessed with sevens. You know, even at the Scarlets were McLeod and Dan Davis, you know, two international quality sevens. Ospreys have got two international sevens. Cardiff have got about six international sevens. And 
the dragons have got two. You know, so sevens, everyone's got a bucket load of them. Number eight, yeah. it's 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 slightly more difficult. And I would like to see Shunza coming in at number eight. I think having a, a six foot six, nineteen stone athlete pick the ball up at the back of the scrum and go at a tiny little outside half. You know, maybe for the Barbarians game is a chance to to kind of show him what he can do, sort of thing. But yeah, well, that's, at that's the kind of what Gatlin of... tried to do with Seb Davis, wasn't it? Yeah, but I think yeah. Shunza can do it. I think I genuinely think Shunza at the back of a scrum. I'd I'd love to see him pick up a ball and just have a run at some tiny little, preferably an English outside half. I'd love to see a wee little English guy going. Fuck me! Look at the size of him. As as he runs over the top of him, I think that will be a good experience that the world could share. And just watching Shunza run over the top just, of him. Just on a side note, have I told you my theory of who I think is going to be wearing the England number ten jersey in three years' time? Go on in. Go on in. Cal- Callum Sheedy. <laughs> oh, no! But hang on a second. <laughs> he doesn't even qualify for England, does he? He does. He qualifies no, he does. for Ireland, qualify. Wales, and, and England. Yeah. He does. He qualifies for three. three no, he qualified for England initially. He qualifies for Ireland, right? That's true. He could play for Ireland, but I don't think he could play for England because he qualified for England through residency. It has to be through ancestry. It can't just be because you previously qualified once upon a time on residency. Uh, I think that's out the window now. But I think he can, he could still, for example, play for Ireland if he doesn't get picked by Wales in three years. But I think the England thing is done. He will have a, Unless, a spreadsheet, mate. There'll, there'll be a whole list of spreadsheets. Actually, actually, actually <laughs> can I take all that back? Because I think he knows a lot more about this kind of like, <laughs> rugby geek kind of shit than me. So he's probably going to put my pants down now. You, you throw, I'm going to reach in the background. You throw, you've thrown me. Actually, you, I think you'll find. He's going to fucking, he's going to ruin, he's going to fucking ruin me now, isn't he? He's, he's going to no, spend the rest of the that in the background. He'll have a, a, everyone's got a granddad from everywhere. Everyone's got a nana from everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. So, right, let's let's quickly talk Argentina and predictions for the World Cup. Where do we think Wales are going to end up? What's the score on Saturday? So, Ed, score prediction on Saturday. It doesn't need to be realistic. It's just a prediction. I think. Um, I think if we play like we did against Australia, um, then I think we'll do really well, and I'm quite confident that we will because we. As we've seen against George and Portugal, we sort of look a bit uncomfortable. We're a team that doesn't like to be uh, in the driving seat and have the ball a lot. Uh, so I think we actually play better against better teams than we do against weaker teams when we're expected to take the initiative because we're not really an initiative-taking team uh, at the moment. Against Argentina, obviously, they're another you know uh, powerful tier one team and they're going to expect to put their own stamp on the game. Uh, so I think we could quite imagine a scenario where we let them have a lot of early ball, let them make mistakes and capitalise, and that's what I hope will happen. Something similar to Australia, and if that happens, I think we could we could be quite comfortable. Another scenario is where they play really well, and I think they they do have big games in them. You know, they can beat anyone on their day. So if they come and they deliver a big game, it could go toe to toe. In in that scenario, I would like to think that uh, we'd have the superior game management and kicking game, especially late down to close it out. So in that case, I'd say Wales by seven or eight points, uh, taking control of the game late on. I actually had an interesting chat earlier. So you remember Luciano Ocara, the the the, the Italian fly off? Yeah. yeah. So he he's, he's at the club. Like his son is one of the kids that I coach. And I was chatting with him earlier. And... Um, because he's Argentinian, and um, he was chatting with Martin Freitas, the number eight, and I had a chat with them, and they were both saying that um, they they really hoped that Argentina picked Sanchez at 10 on uh, yeah. Saturday, which I agreed with, because I think they looked like a far more controlled team. Uh, Carreras at 10 is, you know, he's a flamboyant running fly half, but like World Cup knockout rugby, I think he's he's got a little bit found out in the big games. And I think you need somebody who's going to guide you on the field, uh, make the right decisions at the right time, kick the points, potentially kick the drop goals when when it's needed. And I think Sanchez is that man. They both seem to think the checker was going to go with Carreras. So that selection is key for Argentina. 
Um, I hope they go with Carreras because I, I, I think that will play heavily in our favour. I don't rate them as a game controlling in play off. Whereas Sanchez, he's, he's been there, got the T-shirt. He's one of the best in that sense. So, um, yeah, that'll be interesting to see which way they go. I'm I'm crossing my fingers they pick Carreras. Yeah, okay. same. Every every game they've played, when they brought Sanchez off the bench, they've immediately looked better as soon as he comes on the pitch. I mean, Sanchez is basically like our our Dan Bigger and Carreras is like uh, their uh, you know Costello. He's a he's got he's great. Although I think Costello is better. I think I I would trust yeah, far yeah. I'd far more trust in Costello. Like if 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 he if he had to play if he had to start on Saturday, I'd be fairly comfortable with that. I think he'd be all right. But Carreras, I think he's a bit of a loose cannon. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily, if I was Argentinian fan, I wouldn't necessarily trust him to uh, to manage the game for me. So, Hugh, your your prediction, your expectations of the game, and your uh, your prediction, your score prediction. Well, I, I've been doing a bit of research on some other stuff today, uh, and I've found that if you look back at all Wales's games so far in 2023, we have conceded more penalties than our opposition in all but one game. So, you know, whenever you hear a pundit talking about oh, giving away too many penalties or or whatever it is, pinged off the park, it's not actually an indicator of um, whether you're going to win the game or not. It turns out against the stats. But um, I think it is going to be one of those games where it's just going to be behind the sofa type watching. Do you remember France last time where it was they'd had a man sent off early on and we um, we were top of the world top of the world at the time and it was that dodgy straight up in the air rip that went down couldn't prove that it had gone forward and therefore the try was allowed I think it's going to be one of them I can see Kremer getting sent off in like the second minute and then they're, but they're still leading with like three minutes to go and we're camped on their line I, I, I don't think it's going to be a good watch I think mm. it probably I would go I can see us winning it by two or three two or three see I think you boys just lack the belief that that is needed in Welsh rugby at the minute. I I think we're just going to take them apart. I think from the first kickoff, we're just they they're going to be. They haven't really done anything in the World Cup so far. Uh, really on, I did up. I did say <laughs> I did say if we play like against three, we'll absolutely batter them. I reckon that, that could happen too. <laughs> no, I, I honestly do. I think if we play like that <laughs> and we <laughs> keep our foot on their throat and we control the game with Anscom a bigger just running the show. I reckon uh, Argentina, they, like you say, I think you were about to say, they make a lot of mistakes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they've they've not really set the world alight. I mean, neither have we, but we've scored a lot of tries. And I just think that, you know, there's, there, there is a big performance coming from that Welsh side. I genuinely think that there's there's a lot of something left in that Welsh side. So I'm going to go Wales by 20 and fuck them. Because, uh, you know, that's... that's Let the way I tell can I have a can I have a moan, right? Yeah. Just a, a moan on that point. Yeah. If we could beat them by twenty, and still there'll be fucking there'll still be people not reading us. Still, yeah. everyone is saying, "Oh, they were, oh, but they're still shit," and like, "Oh, the weak side of the draw," and all that, like bollocks. There'll yeah. still be people going on about that. And I, and and frankly, I I don't know, I don't know if I could cope with a semi final island week. Uh, yeah. That would just that would just ruin me. I don't know if I could. See, I would I would much rather get Ireland in the semi final than New yeah, Zealand. Hundred percent agree with that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. I think Ireland are the better team, but at the end of the day, they're Ireland. You like you look at them, you're thinking, okay, we we out throughout the course of our rugby history, we've had the better of Ireland. Yeah. Uh, you know, we well, know the think... players. We can week out. We've beaten them. They've all beaten those players on, on any given day, whether it's at a club level or an international level. They're gonna say the, the team talk is boys. Fucking island, you know. We we say, you don't need to mo- motivate them. and say, look, these boys, you all beat them. You fucking hate them all. You, you, I know you all hate them. So let's just let's just get into them. And like, I think there won't be the psychological edge where you get with the uh, New Zealand. We haven't beat them in seventy years, and mm. uh, you know we lack in that self belief. Even though Ireland, I think objectively are a better team than New Zealand. Mm. Um, I think uh, that's that's a more. I feels like a more winnable match. It's like it feels like a match we could just become completely attritional and crazy and win on passion. Whereas you know a New Zealand match is not going to be like that. No. Yeah. So the better rugby team is going to win, and that's probably going to be them. <laughs> so as uh, Island, uh, Island, we could drag them down to our level, and we could just like you know, it's like get into them a little bit, get or Mahoney to do something stupid. Um, 
you know, if, get if into which Alan Jones is. If Sexton has an off day, hmm. yeah, yeah we, just need, we need somebody to get in into Sexton and make him. Well, look, hmm. this is for next week's podcast, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fucking, but I'm see, already, I'm already thinking about it. I'm, it's already in my head space, you know. That'll just wind the Scottish up because you know <laughs> we're sitting there thinking about what happens when we win the quarterfinals while they're going, hey, we might be home for the start of the URC. So um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, a very different. So right, one final prediction, just because I know there's a couple of English people that listen. Score between England and Fiji. So Ed, score between England and Fiji. Um, I'm saying I think it'll be an absolutely awful game. Um, I think Fiji are struggling for form and they're struggling for inspiration, but I still think that they will pull something out the bag uh, late on in a low-scoring game, and I think they'll win 17-15 against yeah. England, who will probably only kick penalties. Um, and I think there'll just be one moment of magic late on. It'll be a bit like the Samoa game, uh, except it'll be Fiji who has the last word, and they'll send them packing. <laughs> Fiji are, um, and we'll, and the whole world will rejoice as when in a I'm warm sorry. and loving embrace. <laughs> Apart from Nick Knowles, who's going to go and live in Scotland. So, uh, <laughs> you, what, what's your is, he, is Nick Knowles? Nick Knowles is he the is he the guy who presents uh, the, 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 the 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 rugby on HTV England? No, no, he, no, no. He that's, does a, that's he DIYSOS. Does a, yeah, DIYSOS. Ooh. Yeah, he got involved. He, he he's a like a minor Z list celebrity that presents quite a decent program that relies ah. on a, a lot of other people to do work for free. And uh, then okay. He when we beat um, Fiji, he was all yeah. over it about you know the referees this and where yeah, I saw that. In. Yeah, so but I I thought he was the bloke who presents the rugby on HTV because he looked look he like looked it. the same. No, they, no. Do, they do. Look they look right, the same, but no, it's just generic. Because I was when Wales were down in Port, when they were, there was a load of fans down in East, and I was chatting to someone. I was giving some Nick Knowles chat because I'd seen when he's on. I thought he was the HTV because um, I don't watch the tell. Like I've been over here for, for like almost twenty years. So I don't know anything about the tell. Who's on the telly or what the show TV shows yeah. are like? But no. I saw him. I thought he was the TV presenter from HTV. No, he's he's just a Z list dickhead that. Decided to wade in. Well, and then he went, Oh, but I've got family from Swansea. I can't be racist against the Welsh. You know, I've got family in Swansea. <laughs> and, and his family are going, Fuck off, son. You're in England now. You can disappear. <laughs> so, yeah, you can fuck right off. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, gents. Oh, I, uh, my prediction is obviously uh, Fiji oh, by 20. Mind. Yeah, I was going to say, What's your big quickly there? What's your, what's your prediction? What's your school prediction? So, Fiji are like Samoa, but better. Yeah. So I'm going um, Fiji by five. There you go. See, that's more like the kind of uh, Wales to win, England to lose. You can't get better than that to finish a podcast. Yeah, that's what, that's that's what that's what the audience is after, isn't it? That's what puts the viewership numbers up. It's <laughs> yeah. crowd pleasing stuff, you know, crowd pleasing yeah. content. What do you reckon about the other two then uh, quarters? You quickly uh, oh. do you reckon about that? But those two, mm. I cannot call France All Blacks. I think the thing that favours France is it's their home World Cup. Sorry, France Springbok, sorry. Yeah. I can't call that. I think the thing that's in France's favour is their home World Cup and they've got the romance on their side, which is a real thing. Mm. And I think the Springboks are massively underrated. I think they're excellent players, 1-15. to I can't call it. I think I'm going to go France just because it's at home. I think that's literally the deciding factor. I I think France will win that easily. I, I don't I don't see I don't get all the chat to be honest. I think they're a superior team. I think they're gonna have more power, finesse than South Africa. I think they're gonna be inspired. I think they're making a mistake if they pick Dupont. That's for certain. Mm. Uh I think if they pick Dupont, that's a marketing that's a marketing thing because he's 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 on every his his face is on everything over here at the moment. Uh Lucu is one of the best camaraderies in the world and he plays his club rugby with Jali Bear, they run like clockwork. They should back exactly. Him. That's my point. And and I, I, and, and, the, and if they want to, thing. if they want to, if they want to get, and but it's not. You talk about Luku like he's like, uh, like he's fucking Gareth Cooper or something. Like you know, he's, he's or like you know some like some like uh, fourth choice club, clubs come out. Like he's not. He's one of the best clubs in the world. He'd be starting pretty much any other nation. He has mm. uh, intrinsic understanding with Jali Burr. He should. They should start him if they want to nurture. Dupont back in they should give him 20 minutes off the bench but I think I, I can see France doing a job on South Africa 15 points 
that's just because you don't like South Africans and you enjoy a Twitter battle with them, mate. <laughs> I, I do like South Africans. I do like South Africans. That's genuinely my opinion. I, I just think that uh, I, I think France, uh, if France click, as they have done, they will blow you away. I mean, remember what they did to England at Twickenham last year or this year. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, they are they capable. Destroyed they destroyed them. I mean, the, the result in the first match against New Zealand heavily flattered New Zealand. That could have easily been a, a 30 point massacre. Mm. Um, so I, I I think South Africa are not the team they were four years ago. And oh. yeah, okay. So, so think... let's let's wrap it up within who's winning the World Cup. So who who's lifting that in a couple of weeks' time? Go on, Ed, you're first. <sighs> <laughs> Wales. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. That's the hammer. <laughs> we finishing on that, one. Uh, we finish on that. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what you reckon, boys. What you boys reckon? I'm I backed the All Blacks before the tournament and I'm sticking to it. I'm not changing my mind again. I've, I've changed yeah. my mind too many times, so I'm sticking with the All my, Blacks. My, my serious prediction was France. I stick with that. Yeah, and I said Ireland before the World Cup, and I'm, I am sticking with that, even though that would mean that we get knocked out in the semis again. But oh, that'd be fucking unbearable. You can't. I just. Yeah, uh, I know. God, I don't even want to think I about don't. it. I just. All right. Yeah. Anyway, on that note, gents, Ed, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. I hope you've enjoyed it, and yeah. uh, you're welcome back anytime during the season, especially if it's going well. <laughs> that, that would be good but uh, uh, yeah thank you for coming on tonight mate thank you for your time it's been an absolute pleasure uh, gents enjoy your rugby and I'll uh, see you again next week all the best Deal come boys merci beaucoup thank you for listening to the Scarlet's Fever podcast we hope you enjoyed the show Please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to us as it really helps us spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels or email us on welshregionalrugbypod at gmail.com. And remember, whatever the question, rugby is always the answer. Podcast Network.